John Steinbeck, the great writer, once said, the profession of book writing makes horse racing seem like a solid, stable business. Those words have never sounded truer than they do today. Traditional publishing is under threat from all angles. Bookstores are closing around the country. There's a growing fear that print technology is dying out altogether. As always, with great change comes great opportunity. Digital technology has the capacity to bring new forms of reading and new modes of publication. But to understand what the future of the book might look like, it helps to appreciate some of its past. Yale University's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library was built in 1963. Its white alabaster shell has no windows. This is to protect the treasures within. We're joined by David Castan, who is currently writing his own history of the book. Books aren't going away. I mean, I think, and, and the question is what role they'll play seems to me the thing that's hardest to predict. One of the things that is really remarkable is as Europe made the transition from a world dominated by manuscript, and manuscript produced the texts that were bound into books. And then by the end of the 15th century, the print technology takes root. You find lots of people saying, oh, this print technology, it's very interesting, it's very efficient, but it may, you know, everyone has access to everything, there are no controls, one doesn't really know if this thing has any real authority. The vocabularies in which anxiety is expressed are almost exactly the same. The, kinds of anxieties about using Wikipedia. Talking about print and manuscripts, here we have two books which were circulating at the same time. The poem in them is exactly the same, but what's different about the print version and the manuscript version? Well, this is interesting. What we have here, this is a, a manuscript, a, which a commonplace book would be the term, where a, a reader has carefully copied into what were blank pages poems, mostly poems by John Donne. And this is the first printing of Donne's poems. Donne was dead. He died in 1631. And Donne had never been very comfortable with the idea of his poems being printed. Manuscript circulation was in a way safer. Don might have been quite familiar with uh, the feeling people have today, a paranoia that once a text is no longer a book but rather online it can spread by wildfire and get in the wrong hands. Somebody in 1630 might have felt very much the same about the shift from manuscript to print. I think Don did. I think he was very conscious of that. I think that you know, print was Sort of unregulatable in a way that you know, manuscript actually wasn't. I think that narrative of displacement, you know, this kills that, uh, the famous line of Hugo, I, I don't think it usually happens, though I will admit that the you know, horse-drawn buggy hasn't survived the car very well. One of the irreplaceable aspects of the book as a object and as a technology is that the book absorbs histories. So we've got here two prayer books separated by 200 years. One of them is the most exquisite, hand-drawn, beautiful manuscript. And the other is a relatively cheap printed copy designed to look like the manuscript. But what is it which is so unique about the printed copy? What's interesting about this one is if you see there, there's actually, though this is a printed book, there's manuscript in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the writing in here, this writing here says, give me thy grace, good Lord, to set the world at naught. Well, it was written by Sir Thomas Moore. This prayer book, Moore had with him in the tower when he was incarcerated in 1534, and probably returned it to his daughter the night before his execution. The book becomes not merely the, the way in which the text is presented, but th this container uh, sort of just as assumes value of all sorts, and some of it is a kind of fetish value. I was struck the other day, I, I read that someone is now uh, selling a perfume that is the, the smell of old books. David, we've talked about books and fetishes, and this is Shakespeare's 1623 First Folio, perhaps the most fetishistic <laughs> book of all time. What might be forgotten in the history of the book is that all of these objects are commercial objects. That's right. But there's an interesting kind of acknowledgement of this as the, the book was put together by two of Shakespeare's friends, John Hemming and Henry Condell. 
they say here is the book and you can read it and enjoy it any way you want do whatever you want do so but buy it first <laughs> you know <laughs> buy it first <laughs> but whatever you do buy these are commercial properties and one way the book is the first mass produced object available for sale my sense is i think if we didn't have books we'd invent them uh, and, and I, it does seem to me that, that durability is fascinating. We think that for f the regime of the book has lasted 1,500 years. I had a student a couple years ago who, her grandmother passed away. She said the one thing that made it better for her was the grandmother had left her all the grandmother's books. And the young student looked at me and said, it would have been really different if she had left me her Kindle. Joining me now, Ken Oletta. He writes the Annals of Communication, a column for the New Yorker magazine. Tim O'Reilly, founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media. Jonathan Safran Four, author of Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And Jane Friedman, formerly CEO of HarperCollins. She now runs Open Road Integrated Media. It publishes and sells e-books. I am pleased to have each of them here to talk about a, something under great consideration uh, and some angst on the part of a lot of people. It is the future of books in the wake of the digital revolution. Uh, I began by this simple question, because you have talked about this. What is it that books mean as we know them? Books represent civilization, but they have to be read. So they have to be affordable and they have to be convenient to find. And what the e-revolution has done is it has helped in that arena. So do, you don't fear losing something that was in essence about what a book reading was about. Absolutely not. I mean, this is a format. What is the difference if a book is in hardbound or it's paperback or it's in audio, which I think is a wonderful medium for listening to literature? And now the e-format is just another format. And as you know, very well know, everyone is holding some sort of device now along with hopefully as well physical books, I think, there will always be a market for the physical, but it's a wonderful way to read, and we are seeing statistics very quickly. We are seeing that people are reading more now because books are so convenient. convenient. Yes, Jonathan, I, I think I disagree. I, 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 for two reasons. For two reasons. One, you know, books are about having important conversations, yeah. whether they're nonfiction or fiction, important conversations with the culture, important conversations with yourself um, and with the author. And if you think about the most important conversations you have in your life and where you would like to have them and how you would like to have them, the context matters. It's very hard to have an intimate conversation in a public place. It's very hard to have a slow conversation in a fast setting or when you're rushed. And I like the idea of ebooks. I like how they can be how they can democratize books. What, what I'm afraid of is that when they're on platforms that offer so many distractions and are inherently fast, that it's going to be harder and harder to have what makes books books, which is that kind of intimate conversation. And secondly, it's hard to imagine how books can resist the temptations of the technologies that will be available to them. You know, as soon as the New York Times could print in color, affordably they started printing in color. In the case of the Times, that's a good thing. Is it a good thing if novels start to include videos, as they will have to, if they're on platforms that encourage video watching sure. or, or make it possible anyway? Is it a good because people are accustomed to video and they expect video, and if it's mm. not there, why wouldn't why wouldn't you have it? The New York Times would be negligent, you know, if they didn't include video on their website. We would say that they it, it would seem silly to us. Part of what makes books really exhilarating and so open um, and um, allow them to generate the kinds of experiences that they do are the limitations of the form, that it leaves so much room for the reader to do work. You have made the point that books have protected their art form more than any other. You know, I mean, they've, they've taken care of, of their territory. Yeah, not, not, not for entirely good reasons. I mean, yeah. books have been elitist historically um, and haven't been as democratic as they should be, and they've also been conservative. You know, if you think about what was in a, in a gallery downtown 100 years ago as compared to what's in a gallery now, they have almost no relationship to one another. But the novel published yesterday would be recognized by Homer. So... Um, it's been the saving grace of literature in a lot of ways, but it's also run the risk. I think Jane is right that it, it runs the risk of pushing it to the periphery of the culture, of making it something. The culture is better when more people are reading. Um, we just want to yeah, make sure those, those are real reading experiences. Can I, can I just say one thing on this, and that 
you're talking a little bit about enhancements, and I'm talking about actually just a new format of the printed word. And I think that there's a lot of conversation to be had about enhancements, and I think enhancements for fiction will be will not be de rigueur at all. So, and that leads right to Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say it's so important to have historical perspective. You know, what we consider the book today is a relatively recent historical phenomenon and I totally disagree that Homer would recognize the book. You know, actually he would probably more recognize the e-book because I actually read aloud. This just recently I, I came across the wonderful introduction by Freeman Dyson to, to uh, Richard Feynman's The mm -hmm. Pleasure of Finding Things Out and it's so beautiful that I have read it now aloud to f four or five people mm -hmm. because I have it with me. You know, I have all these books and I go, oh, I gotta, I gotta share this with you. So in terms of that social interaction, that availability, there are new possibilities that come out when you have an e-book with you. Now, I love books. I have probably 10,000 books, you know, physical books, and some of them are incredibly beautiful and I love them and I always want to have those beautiful objects. And I do think that one of the things that e-books are gonna do is it's going to force, um, physical books to become beautiful again. I have to say the modern, uh, you know, book is pretty ugly, particularly the big, you know, honking hardback. I, ha you know, I ha can fit a beautiful 1880s edition of The Mill on the Floss in my pocket, you know, and it's leather bound, and I go, why then do I get this thing that looks like this? And it purely was an artifact of trying to fill up as much shelf space as possible in the era of bookstores. And that's, you know, there's so many aberrations in modern publishing that we're in this period of, reinventing you know what is the book and that's in everything from nonfiction where you say why why would you put a dictionary in a book why would you put a map in a book you know uh, you know and we may even ask why would you put certain kinds of novels in a book you know but there will be things that belong in a book and we'll figure those out and we'll figure out the new possibilities that are inherent in the new forms and formats that were developed so what do you think will include in a book what kinds of things well uh, certainly, uh, there are. I mean, th there is that wonderful thing, uh, uh, that experience of immersive reading. You know, it, it, I don't think that will go away. It, it is engaging, but it has always been an elitist uh, persuasion. And and it's again, it's not that um, long-standing. You know, when you think about what were the best best-selling, you know, book in America in the 1850s, they were the poems of Longfellow that were read aloud. You know. <laughs> And you know, most people didn't sit there, you know. And I remember reading this amazing story when Johnson, uh, Samuel Johnson, was uh, reading, uh, was seen to be reading a book without moving his lips. This is in, you know, uh, you know what, you know, 200 years ago. You know, it was considered astonishing. You know, this this guy. He's looking at a book and he's clearly reading it, but he's not moving his lips. You know, so 200 years of what we consider private immersive reading. You know, that's really all we're talking about. Now, Ken Letter, you write books, and your wife represents some of our best authors. Where is publishing going? Well, I think it's it's an exciting time, but it's also a scary time. A uh, scary time, certainly, if you're in the publishing business. It may also be a scary time if you're in the author business. In the traditional publishing business. Yes. yes. For them, That's very they, they important. Are, they are in a very scary yes. position, clearly. Bookstores are in a scary position. Did you hear Tim said the era of bookstores, which, assuming that bookstores are not longer... But, you know, but then, then that raises questions. I mean, one of the, the great things about a bookstore is you, is you get these serendipitous purchases. People walk in and buy things by surprise. That's one of the things that fuels book publishing and their business. And book covers matter. Um, people, the tactile feel of a book, people picking it up. If you lose that, if you lose bookstores, you, lo you lose that. I also worry, and I am an optimist about e-books and about enhanced books, and I understand that change is coming. But the conversation point that Jonathan made, I think is an important one. And it's also a conversation within yourself. I love the fact that I have books on my shelf and, and I'll forget about things. And I could wander around and I'll say, wait a second, isn't there a story in this Carol book that I wanna, I wanna reference in something I'm writing? And I love living in that. And I, I for instance, read last Christmas, Catherine the Great, in ebook form. And and I loved it. It's a wonderful book. And I said, I have to go out and buy the book in hardcover because I need it on my shelf. And I page marked it and I need to but then I realized that the pages don't coincide in the ebook. 
and the hardcover books. I had to spend a goddamn half hour just going through it. And it really, you know, yeah. it was not efficient use of my time. But, you know, there has always been the physical book, and if you want that on your shelf, you want that on your shelf. And I don't think that will ever go away for people, perhaps, of our generation. I mean, one is not sure where the next generation is going, and not even the next generation, but the generation behind that who are really truly digital natives and who I was telling Jonathan before that my granddaughter shows me how to use various parts of various devices and she's three years old um, but having a book on your shelf and I too have that 10,000 book library and I love it and I sit in it every day and I read some of them from my, some books from my shelves and I read on my various devices. Right. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think we're talking about the health of an industry, an industry that has been wedded to one way of doing things for a relatively yeah. long period of time in an yeah, industry. Yeah. There has been no change. It has changed. And the publishers, the traditional publishers, to survive are going to have to change along with it. We never address the consumer. This is unheard of in a business that has a, and I'm going to say a word that I would never say as a literary publisher, a product. But we never address the consumer. We, as editors and publishers, took books on that we loved, including Jonathan's book. But the fact is we never knew who the audience was. We are now being told that we have to know who the audience is. Yeah. And E is allowing us to do that in a much more efficient way. Uh, Jonathan, in, in beyond the fact that you talked about how much you love books and how important they were, does your rational side say, I know this is a losing battle? Books or paper books? Books. Well, books, period. Books. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, a book is a book. However, you read it, you could argue, and that's what James has been saying here. But do, do you sort of say, in the end, I, I can see rationally the on march of time, and I know that this my great uh, attraction and love of this thing is going to go down. Um, there are reasons to be optimistic and reasons to be pessimistic. Why be optimistic? Um, because books do something that, that nothing else can do, and it's something that we need, um, and it's something that we want. So if, if we lose books, what will happen at the same time is we'll lose our um, ambitions, the, 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 our emotional spectrum will be narrowed. And I think this is something that's happening now, and I've been teaching for about seven or eight years, and I feel like I have seen it in the course of seven or eight years with my seen students. Seen what? Seen a narrowing of a kind of emotional spectrum, seen a narrowing of expectations for personal experience as opposed to, um, you know, overseen experience or overheard experience. The, you know, Ken said something so smart about browsing and the internet has hijacked that word. You know, when we talk about browsing, we're talking about surfing the web. Right. But um, it's a very different kind of browsing than browsing one's personal library or browsing a bookstore because that's a kind of browsing that leads to a kind of further solidification of yourself. You go searching for something and the computer provides you with what you were searching for. Amazon tells you what you'll like and they're right. They're almost always right. But there's something better than that. You know, what's better than that is to find something you didn't know you would like. Yeah. And it's very scary that we could lose that experience. Very, I, I love the first part of your comments, but I'm very surprised that you find less variety in the recommendations that come to you on the internet. I have to say, you know, I was always a huge fan of used bookstores because you actually had real variety there. You go into a typical, you know, uh, bookstore, even a superstore, very heavily, you know, curated by, you know, some buyer. Uh, you know, on the internet, I'm continually finding things that, you know, somebody else was reading and they're talking about or sharing. Yeah, I want to move this to, we'll come back to this, but also to the idea of publishing performing an entrepreneurial function, meaning authors can write books that may or may not sell, that whole idea. Of, well, um, there's no question that if you look at Amazon has, has democratized books or e-books uh, and a company like Jane started democratizes books and makes it available more people to be able to write books the que a question becomes what kind of business is it i mean for the, starting with the author will the author be able to make money doing that they have the freedom to write a book to s they can self publish a book now and if they want to do it on their own nickel uh but if they want to do it without an advance can they earn money um, without that advance uh and how do you get more how do you market the book how do you get people to know about it it with with 
people doing so many different things and surfing so many different ways and with so much more available to them, so many more platforms, how do you, how do you discover a book? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a question. And that was a traditional thing the publishers did and did reasonably well. They have become fat and complacent and, and, <laughs> and, they, and they're bloated with costs, and that's a real problem. Yeah. On the other hand, I worry, and I go back to the point we were talking about before, I worry about the, the math. It, can publishers, at a, in a world where increasingly you're moving rapidly towards e-books, and the economy of e-books is much more attractive, yeah. No paper costs, no printing, no distribution costs, no returns. No, no returns. Costs. No trucks. Okay, huge, huge advantage. So at what point do publishers say, hey, I have, it's crazy for me economically to be publishing and printing books. Printing books, not publishing e-books. Yeah. It's, you know, that's a, such a good point because, of course, in, in the UK, oh, in, in most other countries, there were no hardbound books. We did hardcover books here to help our P&L, our profit and loss statement. Do I think that the hardcover cover book will start to diminish in quantity, yes. I don't believe that the publisher, that a true publisher will ever give up on a pay, on printing physical books. No, I disagree but, with that. But, well, yeah. I, I will talk to you about that because I think that there will always be a want and a need for a certain group of society to have the printed book. And perhaps the printed book will become even more expensive and more valuable because it will be printed better and it will be done on better paper, etc. But I think the point of, of marketing is, is where this is all, where this all comes to. And how do you now sell your books, market your books in the e-form, and I think it's a very good, strong business model, Ken. Uh, before you answer that, I'm, I'm going to go back to Jonathan because he's got to do noble service, go pick up his son. <laughs> uh, so what does this mean for you? What's the hard edge of this for you? I don't know exactly what it means for me, and that's what's scary. I mean, it's nice to be, you know, I, I have some history with Jane and trust her and it's it's nice to know that people who I think are intelligent and and coming from a similar reading position that I do are at the forefront of these technological advancements but there's a real extent to which writers are at their mercy it's not a right writers are, are are famously bad at defending themselves and famously bad at being informed about some of these really sweeping movements that are going to perhaps sweep them you know under the rug um, so uh, you know, there, there are, as I said before, there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Um, some of them are kind of scary. The best day I ever had as a writer was about six months ago when Amazon and iTunes both had a, um, a, um, a sale on, on one of my novels. That was, it, it was a cent. And I had more readers in that day than I had in the previous year or two. Um, on the other hand, what happens when books are a cent? What happens when there's no floor? What happens when something of such cultural value is devalued? commercially you know the industry we're worried about the industry's survival but what you said in the beginning is right which is books are civilization and we're more, I'm much more worried about civilization's survival than an industry's survival so main you know maintaining and spreading that these all important I think habits of um, these these conversations these intimate conversations is worries me more than um, what will happen to my books or what will happen to publishers one of the issues with printing is that there really is a step function in the cost of printing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you print smaller quantities, it becomes more expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, it's certainly true that y you can go print on demand. For example, 80% of, uh, of my company's books are now print on demand, uh, just even when we're printing 10,000 copies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're working with Ingram and they've done a fantastic job of building an infrastructure that lets us uh, do whatever, mm -hmm. you know, quantity we want. And it's, and it's integrated with a, a digital tool chain that allows us literally to publish a book, to an e-book in f five or six different formats, uh, push it out into a digital tool, the digital uh, distribution chain, you know, immediately. So we have we have this uh, new kind of logistics of book publishing, which is very powerful, uh, that reduce costs. But I still think, you know, at some point there really aren't enough distribution points for uh, many types of books for them to remain in print. That's not to say that there won't be some books that are still printed, but I guarantee you that I would I would guess that 80% of what is now put into on 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 paper will go away. Well, I believe that 80% of popular fiction will become ebooks only. Because I think that area, just popular fiction, yeah. um, genre popular fiction will all go e.
And but I do think that in literature in particular, there will still be a P component. But I I don't disagree with you yeah. that it's switching. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I think it'll for a while actually though popular fiction will probably last longer in print because there are still more outlets. You know, they're sold in supermarkets, they're sold in you know airports. They're sold. But they're also downloadable yeah. on an airplane. No, I understand. But yeah, yeah. I, I do think that the, the trailing edge uh, is going to be popular mm. fiction. Uh, from the point of view of market demand for P. What's the, what is the battle royale today within the digital community about books? I mean, competition between uh, Amazon and Apple and everybody else. Well, and Google and, Google. and, and Barnes and Noble. I mean, the, Kobo. before the Kobo, right. before the um, uh, before the the Apple deal with the book publishers with five of the six big book publishers, Amazon had ninety percent market share of eBooks. Um, and what the publisher said is we have to create this what they called an agency model and the deal with Apple to set prices in order to to attack this monopoly that that Amazon was gaining over ebooks so what happened was that that gave a breather to Barnes and Noble and Google and 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 obviously the the iPad and iPhone and market share of Amazon went from 90 percent of ebooks to 60 percent then Justice Department weighed in and said this is a violation of antitrust because you're charging consumers a higher price, worried about the consumer, and this is bad, and therefore we're suing you and forced to settle. And so the question then becomes, will Amazon regain market share and, and, and approach uh, once again that 90 percent, which qualifies the monopoly, and what consequences does that have if they do achieve that? Mm. And of that's course, this is nothing that the consumer knows about. I mean, the consumer wants uh, wants to buy books at a price that the consumer thinks is the right price. And I know that Jonathan said something about devaluing books by having them at a lower price. I think that's a very old argument. Um, I have mm. to say that the it, where money it, where money is at stake, it's not the devaluing of the author's words. It's it's hurting the actual profit and loss statement. But I think that um, what is just most important is for the, and having been a traditional publisher for a long time and now being an e-publisher only, um, I am really seeing that people are picking up the, the pace of reading and reading more and reading in places that they never read before. And so I'm completely optimistic. I also think that we are in a very author-centric time that we are pro the author, positive, it's a positive time for authors to be published because they can publish themselves or they can be published by traditional or non-traditional publishers. I think we're in a very author-centric time. What does Newsweek signify? Well, it, it, it's actually consonant with the conversation we're having here today. It, it's happening in newspapers as well where they're saying we cannot afford to print newspapers, so maybe once or twice a week, Christian Science Monitor once Times a week, Picayune. Mm -hmm. Times Picayune, Detroit News, mm -hmm. Cleveland Plain Dealer, but Newsweek saying we're just going to do it online. That is happening in the print world, not just in newspapers or magazines, but obviously it's going to books, which is one of the questions why at some point there's at least a question mark whether they'll be able to continue publishing mm. bound books. Well, you know, kind of come back though to Socially, what role books play? Um, you know, there's sort of this cultural significance of the quote literary author. It really matters to a relatively small number of people. It's a you know, it's an elitist thing. There's this popular fiction. There is serious nonfiction. You know, uh, which is really in the same category as serious reporting of all kinds. You've used uh, this phrase elitist twice in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, what I mean is uh, the notion by some group that their favorite activity is so important that it needs to be protected. What, 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 if, what if it were defined differently as, 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 as a group that says, this is part of what you talked about earlier of preserving the culture? I, I would say that um, the culture, uh, it, let me give you an example. T take classical music. You know, what we call classical music today used to be popular music. You know, Franz Liszt was like the Beatles, right? And now classical music is in this ghetto uh, uh, of this very small number of people who are, you know, playing for each other. 
and saying we should be subsidized because we're this important cultural phenomenon. And the fact is, you know, the music that will be remembered from our era you know, and will be the, quote, classical music of the future is the popular music of today. I actually think that it, you know, I mean, you know, look at classical, classic authors, you know, Dickens, you know, people, you know, literally there were riots when the new edition of a you know, book came, mm -hmm. people trying to get it, you know, in faraway places, you know, the new fascicle came out from, you know, Bleak House, you know. But I, I, I since we've had this conversation, I know you support things like PBS and NPR. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things they do is, is basically subsidize, in part, the culture with some government support of, of saying it's important you know, The amount of government support for PBS is relatively small. A huge part of the support comes from people who care about it. It's, it's not actually a subsidized activity so much as it's subject to market forces and there are a set of people who say, I want that, I like it, I want to pay for it. And I think, you know, you see this with new technology platforms like Kickstarter, where people I, are, you know, saying, hey, would you like this? Would you pay for this? And there's this incredible new direct mechanism for authors and other creators to say, would you care about what I want to I produce? I am so glad that you brought that up, because, Ken, I think the elitist element was that books were selected, and it was the editor who selected it, and then it was put into certain bookstores. And the independent bookstore, which I am a great fan of was a little intimidating for people who didn't know who how to find the book that they wanted then the superstores tried to make that better and the big box merchandisers but books have always been thought of as part of us true literature and fine nonfiction has always been thought of as a very small universe and what E has done now and I'm so glad you mentioned Kickstarter which I think is brilliant yeah. because why shouldn't people pay for a book that they want to be written. And this sound, it's, a, it's a theory that anyone who's grown up in publishing thinks is absolutely cuckoo, but it's not. Because you're now having the consumer say, that's a very good idea. And if a publisher won't give you that $10,000 advance, we will put up $100 and reach that $10,000. But Jane, I, I, you can have both. Yes, you can uh, have both. Okay. And I, I, mean, believe, I, I, I believe we're going, fruit here. I, mean, I believe we're going to have both. I think, you know, Tim and I disagree with that. I think there, there will always be always there will for the foreseeable future be printed books but i think that the move to electronic distribution of information and education and entertainment is going to come from the e-space and i and i'm very very encouraged right. but here it goes back to your question charlie about newsweek and it goes back to the question of newspapers and it goes to the question of books when you go you, you, you're always going to have an economic issue, and the economic issue is how do you support things that are important? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.